Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the topic of purine synthesis. This is a very important topic, and I highly recommend you guys subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with all the new content that we are releasing pretty much every single day. As you know, uh, all of our content is free, but we really appreciate it, really appreciate it if you could turn off your ad block to allow us to continue to make these videos completely free so we don't have to charge you and we can make some extra cash off of the stupid ads that you might be seeing. So with that being said, let's dive right in by first doing an overview or I guess a review of DNA. Very simple, very straightforward. DNA is your genetic code and it's located in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. You should know this by now. Now, the DNA itself is a polymer of nucleotides which are known as pyrimidines and purines these are the two classifications and in purines you have two main structures or two main components that you need to know two main nucleotides these are this these two right here as you can see on the bottom right hand corner of the screen you have adenine and guanine a g how can you remember that? Well, AG is also the uh, the uh, abbreviation for gold. And if you want to remember purine, remember pure. It's also known as pure as gold. Okay. All right, cool. Pretty straightforward. Easy, easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. All right. So DNA itself can actually be used as a source of energy, especially in uh, physiologic mediators. Ignore my writing all over this. But yeah, so it can be used as a source of energy. How is that going to happen? Well, first of all, it's more common with purines. And second of all, an example of this is cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. These are used as physiologic mediators. But what else is a, a uh, application of purines in this sentence, in aka in terms of energy? Well, think about a... Uh, adenine. Adenine can be converted downstream into ATP, adenine triphosphate. Boom, that's energy. Pretty straightforward. Essentially, just add plus three phosphate groups to this molecule and you'll get ATP. Now that is a rough overview of DNA. Let's talk about purine synthesis because that's the topic that you are watching this video for. Purines come from multiple sources, okay? First off, you have your diet. We are ingesting purines all the time. Second of all, they're coming from the direct synthesis of these purines. The biochemical pathways actually form these purines, okay? That is happening. And then you also have the salvage pathway, something we will discuss down the road. So these are the three main sources that you have to produce purines. Remember, the salvage pathways are very important because once you produce these, once you synthesize these, you don't want all that biochemical work to get wasted. So you need to have a way of salvaging these as well so you don't have to do extra work to reform them every single time, right? Our bodies are very efficient and this is just but one example of how efficient our, the human body is even at a molecular level. Now, there are different pathways for purine versus pyrimidines in terms of synthesis, which you, we will talk about down the road. Always remember, though, is that, re, uh, that RNA is going to be synthesized first. So RNA will then become DNA. And that's why purines are also very important because they play a role in RNA and DNA, as do pyrimidines, but purines specifically. So let's talk now about this synthesis process. This image very high yield, very important. Why? Because there are two essential components of any, any nucleotide that you need to know. Number one is going to be the component of carbon. All right, which are these right here. This molecule, this molecule, this molecule, this molecule, and this molecule. And then number two is going to be nitrogen. Right here, right here right here and right here. All right, pretty straightforward, right? Well, I wish it was that simple. You need to know where these uh, these amino acids, uh, excuse me, where these components are coming from. So when it comes to nitrogen, they're coming from amino acids and it's pretty important or it's pretty high yield for you to know which amino acids. So the first one is gonna be aspartate, glutamine, and then glycine, okay? Realistically, I have no acronym for this, so I'm going to be honest with you, memorize this. Okay, pretty straightforward. If you really want to go and be an overachiever, you can memorize that the first nitrogen in the first spot, it comes from aspartate. Mm, I feel like it's a point of, you know, you hit that point of diminishing returns where all this memorization is going to be useless. So I wouldn't personally memorize which carbon is coming from where, right? Or which nitrogen is coming from glycine, glutamine, 
and uh, which one's coming from aspartate. I think that's too much. Just remember aspartate, glutamine, glycine, in case you get asked which of these amino acids uh, plays a direct role in purine synthesis, especially as it pertains to nitrogen uh, uh, activity. The second thing you need to know is carbon. Carbon comes from a variety of sources. The two main really are going to be uh, carbon dioxide and tetrahydrofolate, as you can see right here, respiratory carbon dioxide. And then you have various forms of tetrahydrofolate right here. Okay, pretty straightforward. Remember this, just memorize this. I want to say it's high yield, but really this is a memorization point. Not much critical thinking there. So let's talk about the actual process of synthesizing purines. Well, the main goal in our body when we're synthesizing purines is to create AMP and GMP. Why is that the case? Because this is a very versatile uh, uh, molecule. AMP can even become, you know, ATP, or it can go directly into being used up in the RNA and DNA process in the DNA formation, right? So it's very, very versatile. Same thing with GMP it can become GTP or it can become cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a very versatile product. This is the main thing we really want. So we're gonna start off with something called the ribose 5-phosphate product or the, or the ribose 5-phosphate, I like to say, the backbone. Now, this is gonna come from the HMP shunt. High yield, you understand where this is coming from, okay? The ribose 5-phosphate is coming from the HMP shunt. High yield. Step one is going to be creating a molecule called PRPP. I'm not going to go into talking about what the exact name is. Super long, pretty useful. You'll get the acronyms. Okay, but that's step one. So create PRPP. Then you're going to convert PRPP into something called IMP. And then IMP can then be formed into AMP and GMP, which is the goal. So the rate limiting enzyme in this whole, whole process is going to be something called glutamine PRPP amidotransferase. This if you cannot tell by the image, is very high yield. High yield AF. Okay. High yield as F. So you can figure that out. Okay. This is very important. Memorize this. Commit this to memory. So what does this molecule do? It plays a role right here. That is where it is affecting the, the whole process of synthesizing purines. Glutamine, PRPP, amidotransferase, plays a role in converting PRPP into IMP, all right? The name kind of gives it away too. All right, so let's get an overview idea of what's going on. Here you got ribose 5-phosphate. Where is ribose 5-phosphate coming from? HMP shunt gives us ribose 5-phosphate. Ribose 5-phosphate gets converted into PRPP, and then PRPP has to be converted into IMP. Now, does it just get converted by itself? No. Remember, we were talking about where the synthesis process uh, gets its its components. Where do the nitrogenous and the carbon uh, uh, components come from? Well, they come from a variety of sources like amino acids, carbon dioxide, and tetrahydrofolate. This is where they all play a role. When PRPP is being converted into IMP, when PRPP is going to IMP, you are also going to see the nitrogen uh, products coming in from the amino acids. And then you have the carbon components coming in from the tetrahydrofolate and the carbon dioxide. Okay, this all happens because of an enzyme called glutamine. PRPP amidotransferase, which is the rate limiting step. This entire process, okay, right here, this arrow, the one that I made the largest, is a very important arrow because it allows us to see this is where pretty much everything is going on. This part, honestly, this part, don't remember this. And this, eh, low yield. This location, high yield. High yield location something you need to remember okay and then you will make from imp amp and gmp and that'll go and do its thing you can also go ahead and salvage it by going backwards into this process okay imp can also be salvaged amp gmp as well so that is pretty straightforward so why is this important why are these components very important because amp can be converted into atp and gtp all right this is used in RNA synthesis. And ATP can then be converted into deoxy or DATP and deoxy GTP, okay? 
or DGTP. Where is this used? This is used in DNA synthesis, okay? So I'm going to draw it out for you. Now remember, we had dot, dot, dot from the previous thing. We had IMP, which gets converted into AMP, and it gets converted into GTP. All right, this is going to play a role. Sorry, GMP. GMP. Okay. Now, this whole structure, these two structures, will then be converted into ATP and G. Oh, excuse my poor handwriting. GTP by adding plus two phosphate groups, right? Because you already have a monophosphate on both sides here. Then you have the triphosphate, ATP and GTP. This, these two are used up in RNA. So we can make RNA from here. But if we go forward, we can make deoxy ATP and deoxy GTP by a product or by an enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase. So ribonucleotide, ribonucleotide reductase. I'm just going to call it RBR for now. Ribonucleo or RNA, whatever. Ribonucleotide reductase, that's what I'm calling it. There's no really abbreviation for this, but for the sake of the video. Uh, this enzyme is going to convert GTP into DGTP and ATP into DATP to then be used in DNA synthesis. And that's how we tie it all back together. Now, obviously, this is very simple, so you should have a clinical context to everything we're talking about. The main clinical context is uh, medications in this, in this lecture. The medications are important because you can actually affect the growth of organisms or the growth of cancers by targeting purines because these components, these are components of both RNA and DNA. So how do you do that? Well, there's one drug called the ribavirin. It's an anti viral drug, it's often given to uh, uh, treat something called uh, paramyxa of viruses, aka RSV, right? These are a type of antiviral drugs. This will prevent uh, purine synthesis in viruses, okay? Then you also have mycophenolate. Mycophenolate is an immunosuppressant medication that's also used in uh, the human body, especially in cases where you have an overactive immune system or even in cases of cancer. And that, that's very important for you to understand because you want to prevent the rapidly... Uh, uh, um, rapid replications, as well as, as overly active parts of our body, all right? So that's where mycophenolate is used. Now, the mechanism of both of these drugs is essentially to block IMP dehydrogenase. IMP dehydrogenase is going to blunt the conversion of IMP into GMP, and this is going to inhibit the synthesis of the guanine nucleotide. So if you don't have any GMP, you will not have any GTP, okay? and you will not have any DGTP. That means you will not be able to make any RNA or any DNA, and essentially the cell will die off, or the organism will die off, okay? That is why this is all so important. This is why you need to know. Now, we're going to go deeper into these immunosuppressive and antiretroviral medications in subsequent lectures, but understand that these two are inhibitors of purine synthesis. Okay, pretty straightforward. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to our content. Make sure you understand this stuff very well. And if you want to see more videos like this, go check out our website, www.madmedicine.org, where we have more educational content for you completely free of charge. Yeah, free of charge. I hope this was helpful.